We're very honored to have Dr. Emery Lobbins here with us, who I don't think needs any introduction, so I'll let him just go straight into his presentation. Thank you. Since you already have my background in your program, I think that's a splendid introduction because it gives us more time together. Uh, as a recovering physicist whose first professional paper on climate change was in 1968, I'm particularly happy and honored to be able to share with you <coughs> and update the findings of an ambitious synthesis of American energy solutions and <coughs> a similar work just completed for China, uh, both with much wider implications. Uh, the U.S. work was created uh, over six quarters by 61 of us at Rocky Mountain Institute with much help from industry on content and peer review and building on three decades of practice across all energy using sectors and most kinds of supply. Our findings were <coughs> uh, summarized in a graphics rich, uh, rigorous but readable uh, business book. Uh, and the book is called uh, Reinventing Fire. Its forwards are by the president of Shell Oil and the then chairman of Exelon, which may surprise you a bit when you hear what's in it. Uh, <coughs> we, we began by asking what uh, if we could make energy do our work without working our undoing? Could we imagine fuel without fear? Could we reinvent fire? And we chose that big poetic title because long ago fire made us human and fossil fuels made us modern. But now we need a new fire that makes us safe, secure, healthy, and durable. That turns out to be <coughs> not just feasible, but to work better and cost less than what we're doing now. So let's see how. The four-fifths of the world's energy still comes from burning each year about 20 cubic kilometers of the rotted remains of primeval swamp goo extracted with immense skill. And those fossil fuels have built our civilization, created our wealth, enrich the lives of billions of people. But the rising costs to our security, economy, health, and environment are eroding, if not outweighing their benefits. So we need a new fire. And switching from the old fire to the new fire <coughs> changes two big stories, oil and electricity. Uh, each now releases two-fifths of the fossil carbon. Today, these stories are less than 1% connected in the U.S. and less than 5% in the world. But the uses are similarly concentrated. Three-fourths of U.S. oil fuels transport or mobility. Three-fourths of electricity powers buildings. The rest of both runs factories. So very efficient transport and land use buildings and factories can save oil and the coal that makes two-fifths of U.S. electricity and the natural gas that can displace them both. But today's energy system is not just <clears throat> inefficient, it's also disconnected, aging, dirty, and insecure. So it needs refurbishment. But by 2050, we found it could become efficient, connected, and distributed with elegantly frugal vehicles, buildings, and factories, all relying on a secure, modern, and resilient electricity system. So the U.S. could eliminate its addiction to oil and coal by 2050 and use a third less natural gas while switching to threefold more efficient use and quintupled or by then three-fourths renewable supplies. So that's the transition I'll describe. And we found that by 2050 this could cost the United States five trillion dollars less in net present value than business as usual, assuming <coughs> that uh, carbon emissions and all other hidden or external costs are worth zero a conservatively low estimate. Yet this cheaper energy system could support a 2.6-fold bigger economy, all without needing oil or coal, or for that matter, nuclear energy. And we showed that this transition needs no new inventions and no new federal taxes, subsidies, mandates, or laws and running Washington gridlock. Maybe that's the most surprising part, so I'll say it again. I'm going to tell you how the United States can get completely off oil and coal $5 trillion cheaper with no act of Congress led by business for profit. <clears throat> Many policy changes are needed to enable and speed this transition, but it turns out they can all be done administratively or at a state level where the U.S. has long made most of its energy policy anyway. 
This energy solution, therefore, uses America's most effective institutions, private enterprise co-evolving with civil society, sped by military innovation, to go around our least effective institutions. And whether you care most about profits, jobs, competitive advantage, or national security, or climate protection, environmental stewardship, creation care, public health, reinventing fire makes sense and makes money. General Eisenhower reputedly said that expanding the boundaries of a tough problem makes it soluble by encompassing more options, more synergies, more degrees of freedom. So in reinventing fire, we integrated all four energy using sectors, transport buildings, industry, and electricity. Uh, and we integrated four kinds of innovation, not just the usual two, technology and public policy, but also design, the way technologies are combined, and uh, strategy, new competitive uh, strategy, new business models. And those combinations yield much more than the sum of their parts, especially at creating some deeply disruptive business opportunities. <coughs> that is perhaps most obvious in the technology of <coughs> automobiles. Let's start there because they're the biggest oil user. Um, I, I will go very lightly over the oil story, which was also laid out in an earlier Pentagon co-sponsored book called Winning the Oil Endgame, because I want to concentrate for this group more on electricity. Uh, <coughs> But the basic physics of cars is such that weight causes two-thirds of the energy use to move a car. Uh, and every unit of energy you save at the wheels by removing weight or drag saves another six units you don't need to waste getting it to the wheels. So it leverages seven units of fuel savings at the tank. Uh, <clears throat> Fifteen years ago, my team designed a half-weight carbon fiber hybrid sports utility vehicle boosting efficiency by a factor four to six with a two-year payback. Uh, and then eight years ago, Toyota showed such a concept car that has the interior volume of a Prius, half the fuel use, and a third the weight. Curb weight's 420 kilograms. Uh, <coughs> they didn't do it just for amusement. And now one and two liter equivalent per hundred kilometer carbon fiber electrified cars are on the market uh, from Volkswagen and from BMW, which confirmed that the carbon fiber is indeed paid for by needing fewer batteries. <clears throat> An RMI spin-off uh, developed an even uh, faster and cheaper manufacturing technology, brought along my carbon cap today, which was made with that process in one minute eight years ago, has a test piece for military helmets that have been shipping for a few years. Uh, and this process can now make complex two by two meter parts in one minute. Uh, if I ring this like a bell, you can hear it's really strong and stiff. We can pass it around as long as I get back. Uh, <coughs> now, if we made all U.S. autos this way, we'd save half an OPEC or one and a half Saudis by drilling in a very prospective play called the Detroit Formation. And the cost of <coughs> saving that roughly 15 million barrels a day, would be $18 a barrel and falling. And that's to pay for the electrification because the ultralighting is approximately free. It is paid for by a two-thirds smaller powertrain and by radically simpler automaking with 80% lower capital cost. Uh, now, ultralight electric vehicles can spread and their costs can drop even faster with a temporary fee bait. That's a policy that provides rebates for efficient new autos paid for by fees on inefficient one, ones in each size class. And the biggest of six fee bait programs in France in the first two years tripled the speed of improving auto efficiency. Uh, the strongest one in Norway raised electric vehicles market share last year to 12.5%, which is 10 times the US level. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the, the economic effect is to uh, let auto buyers apply a societal discount rate, so they look at the full 15 years of life cycle fuel saving, not just the first year or two. The same physics and the same business logic apply also to big vehicles. Walmart's heavy truck fleet is using smarter designs and logistics to use half the fuel per case of merchandise that they used a decade ago. But just the technological fuel saving in heavy trucks 
can rise to two-thirds, and that plus the triple to quintuple efficiency airplanes uh, <clears throat> being designed in places like Boeing and NASA and MIT can save the U.S. together about $0.9 trillion net present value. In both heavy and light vehicles, today's military revolution in energy efficiency will speed all of the advances in the civilian sector, which uses over 50 times as much oil. Uh, much as military R&D created the internet, global positioning system, the jet engine and microchip industries, only <clears throat> this time the leverage can speed America's path off oil, so we needn't fight over oil, and then our warfighters can have neg emissions, mission unnecessary, uh, in the Persian Gulf and the South China Sea. And they really like that idea. Autos are not just becoming four to eight times more efficient, they're also being driven less. Uh, even in Europe and in America where gasoline use has been falling since 2007. Uh, Gen X and Gen Y tend not even to want to own a car because it's cheaper and easier not to. A, a young Londoner or Shanghainese on an evening out can combine many different modes uh, <clears throat> because now smartphone apps can bridge once awkward route gaps by summoning ubiquitous transport services on demand. One San Franciscan saved $11,000 a year just by replacing her car with Uber, Lyft, public transit, uh, walking, biking, and get around, which is a smartphone service for renting your neighbor's car when it's unneeded and parked, as U.S. cars are about 95% of the time. So such IT and connectivity solutions create the sharing economy. As Tom Friedman recently said, the world's biggest media company, Facebook, owns no newspapers. The world's biggest hotelier, Airbnb, owns no beds. The world's biggest taxi service, Uber, owns no cars. Uh, they all just enable you to rent other people's underutilized assets. Now, seamlessly linking access options with needs makes you confident you won't need a car. But if you do, you don't need to own it. In some Chinese cities, renting a Kandi electric vehicle from this giant vending machine costs about $3 an hour. Also, renting shared cars when you need them can boost their utilization roughly tenfold, and then probably double it again with partly or fully autonomous vehicles like this Mercedes-Benz concept car. Google plans to release self-driving cars <clears throat> in the next three years. The biggest U.S. company, Apple, is developing them too. They're already legal in at least four states, and they're the theme of next year's Dutch presidency of the EU. Autonomy makes electric vehicles total cost per kilometer 40% lower than that of fueled vehicles because their tenfold lower energy cost per kilometer more than offsets their initially higher capital cost. So the mobility IT mashup means radically fewer vehicles, all electric, driving fewer total kilometers. And shared electric vehicles providing mobility services could drive a million kilometers because carbon fiber doesn't dent rust or fatigue. So autos are morphing from what we call PIGs, that is, personal internal combustion gasoline steel-dominated vehicles, to SEALs, which are shareable, electrified, autonomous, lightweight service vehicles. There must be a good graphic lurking in there somewhere. Uh, <coughs> SEAL's uh, business and marketing case is strong and they will further speed the day when cars use no oil. Meanwhile, <coughs> public transport in innovation, China's 3,000 kilometers of bus rapid transit, BRT, may quintuple in the next five years. This is a low-tech, high-design, retrofitable innovation that transformed this Hangzhou street into this street, uh, <coughs> carrying 800,000 riders daily. Over 300 million commuters use BRT each day in nearly 200 cities worldwide. Uh, it can achieve subway-like route density at 5% the cost. The architect mayor of Curitiba, Brazil, uh, invented BRT as a cheaper, faster, better alternative to cars because Curitiba had Brazil's second highest car ownership. So he retrofitted BRT throughout his Houston-sized city of 2 million people in just four years losing only a few buildings and achieving Brazil's lowest car drivership and cleanest urban air. So now BRT and other non-car modes are reshaping the America's worth of new cities that China plans for the next 15 years. Architect Peter Calthorpe is helping redesign, for example, Chenggong around one and a half million pairs of feet, not cars, 
so driving will fall by two-thirds. Integrating and distributing where people live, work, shop, and play means people needn't travel far nor by car. Each 13-lane super boulevard is replaced by a pair of one-lane, one-way streets. Between those pairs, a car-free bus rapid transit street, and between those, pedestrian and bicycle streets. So the shift from a super block arterial vehicle network to a capillary web builds a human ecology with vibrant commerce, rich social interaction, a third less concrete, but equal or better throughput, cleaner air, <coughs> happier citizens, and about two-thirds less carbon. And the 53 cities already adopting this design will use little oil, and there will be others. Even in the car-dominated U.S., where we've already built our cities around cars, not people, uh, such new urbanist smart growth plus mobility IT integration and charging real-time driving costs per kilometer, not per liter, uh, can provide the same or better access with 46 to 84 percent less driving at lower cost with higher developer profits. <coughs> so 35 years hence, a far more mobile U.S. economy, as you see in the subtitle, uh, can use no oil, saving or displacing each barrel for $25, rather than buying it for the officially projected long-run price upwards of 100, saves $4 trillion present value, or $12 trillion if we had counted just the hidden economic and military costs of U.S. oil dependence, but no others, including climate. So to get mobility without oil, to phase out the oil, we can first get efficient <coughs> and then switch fuels. Those one or two liter per hundred kilometer uh, autos can use any mixture of hydrogen fuel cells in green at the bottom uh, or uh, electricity in yellow or advanced biofuels in orange. Uh, the heavy trucks and airplanes can realistically use advanced biofuels or hydrogen Trucks could even burn natural gas, but no vehicles will need oil. Any biofuels the U.S. might need at most 3 million barrels a day could be made two-thirds from waste without using any cropland and without harming climate or soil. In fact, we would pay farmers and ranchers to take carbon out of the air and stick it back in tilth where it belongs. So our little team at Rocky Mountain Institute speeds these oil savings by what we call institutional acupuncture, where the business logic is uh, congested and not flowing properly, we insert little needles in selected points and partners like Ford and Walmart and the Pentagon to get that entrepreneurial juice, that uh, chi flowing. Uh, this long transition is already so well underway <coughs> that five years ago some mainstream uh, analysts were already starting to see peak oil, not in supply but in demand, because like whale oil in the 1850s, oil is becoming uncompetitive even at low prices before it becomes unavailable even at high prices. So yes, the oil companies are at risk because a lot of their booked reserves on their balance sheet uh, cannot be burned, but they're even more at risk by market competition than by climate regulation because a larger fraction of their reserves cannot be sold when they compete with the kinds of options I've just described. But Electrified autos don't need to add new burdens to the electricity system. Rather, when smart autos exchange electricity and information through smart buildings with smart grids, they are adding to the grid valuable flexibility and distributed storage that help the grid to integrate varying solar and wind power. So electrified autos make the auto and electricity problems easier to solve together than separately. Uh, Eisenhower again. Uh, and they converge the oil story with our second big story, saving electricity and then making it differently. And those two twin revolutions in electricity are already bringing more numerous and diverse and profound disruptions than in any other sector uh, as 21st century technology and speed collide head on with 20th and even 19th century institutions, rules, and cultures. Electricity saving technologies can evolve dramatically as the history of lighting shows. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, you know, Edison's electric lamps got 11-fold more efficient, but that took 130 years. Various other types <coughs> improved several-fold over decades. 
But then look at the curve for the efficiency gain of white light emitting diodes. Uh, they, uh, every, every decade, they get 30 times more efficient, 20 times brighter, and 10 times cheaper. So McKinsey forecasts that their makers will cut costs and grow revenues 30% a year and take two-thirds of the world's general lighting market just five years from now. So they're rocking the $200 billion a year market for lighting services. And since lighting uses a seventh of the world's electricity, LEDs are also disrupting the business model of electric utilities, which since 1892, overruling Thomas Edison's better judgment, uh, have sold electricity as a commodity rather than as a service or infrastructure so that more efficient use of electricity reduces their revenues, not their costs. Uh, now, the steep slope of this LED efficiency curve is mirrored by something that in physics terms is roughly LEDs inside out, namely photovoltaics. Uh, U.S. electricity from various fossil fuels, just the fuel cost of fueled power generation is these lines down here, just got fatally disrupted by PVs and even by wind, uh, <coughs> which is even cheaper, uh, by this sudden meteorite strike. And th this is what a game changer looks like. And uh, of course, wind power now usually beats just the operating costs of gas or coal plants in the windier parts of the country. Now, changing how we make electricity gets easier if we need less of it. Most of it today is wasted, and efficiency techniques keep improving uh, faster than they're applied, so the potential savings get ever bigger and cheaper. The low-hanging fruit keeps growing back faster than we can harvest it. Uh, <clears throat> but as buildings and industries start to get efficient faster than they grow, America's electricity use, instead of uh, <clears throat> increasing 1% a year, as is still officially forecast, could actually decrease 1% a year, even after the extra use by the efficient electric cars. And indeed, this is already happening. U.S. electric use peaked in 2007. And just in 2012 alone, the electricity use adjusted for weather per dollar GDP fell by an unprecedented 3.4%. Uh, we can keep demand dropping by reasonably accelerating existing trends. Specifically, over the next 40 years, U.S. buildings, which remember use three quarters of the electricity, can triple or quadruple their energy productivity, saving $1.4 trillion net present value with a 33% internal rate of return. So the savings are worth four times their costs. Industry, <clears throat> using the other quarter of the electricity, can double its energy productivity with a 21% internal rate of return. And to do all this by 2050, we need to speed, to, to uh, achieve by 2030 the average adoption of efficiency that the Pacific Northwest states already did 10 years ago, whatever exists as possible. Now, a key to such big savings is a disruptive innovation we developed at our little black swan hatchery and call integrative design. It often makes very big energy savings cost less than small or no savings. That turns diminishing returns to efficiency investments, which are assumed in every economic model, into expanding returns. Remember how lightweighting autos shrinks their powertrain, helping to pay for the, the uh, advanced electric one and to pay for the lightweighting that makes it affordable? Well, Integrated design can do the same thing in buildings and factories, radically reducing electricity and gas demand so renewables can more readily serve the rest. None of this is in any official study or forecast, and not for lack of trying to tell them. I think it's largely because theoretical economists have trouble wrapping their minds around expanding returns because it makes their models blow up, which is embarrassing. Uh, <clears throat> but it's real. We've demonstrated this now we and others in over 1,000 buildings, not counting 30,000 or so in Europe, uh, and $40 billion worth of factories and various land and sea vehicles. Let me ex give you a few examples. Uh, integrated design is how our 2010 retrofit is saving two-fifths of the Empire State Building's energy. Remanufacturing at 6,500 windows on site into super windows that pass light but block heat 
plus better lights and office equipment and so on, cut the maximum cooling load by a third, but then renovating smaller chillers instead of adding bigger ones saved $17 million of capital cost, paying for most of those improvements uh, <clears throat> and cutting the payback to three years. That's the same payback, by the way, that a major energy service company had offered to save a sixth as much electricity because they optimized components singly, whereas we optimized the building as a system. And by the way, if we had counted the non-energy benefits that have greatly increased real estate value and human performance in this building, the owner's actual payback would be well under one year. Uh, <clears throat> now, you might think that I'd burn a lot of gas to stay warm in a much smaller building at 2,200 meters elevation in the Colorado Rockies where it used to go to minus 44 Celsius. But my house does no combustion, that's so 20th century, uh, and has no heating system. Super insulation, ventilation, heat recovery, and super windows that insulate like 16 sheets of glass, but look like two and cost less than three, make it 99% passive solar heated. Eliminating the heating system paid up front for the efficiency that displaced it and it saved about 90% of household electricity as well. Now, the central atrium seen here in a February snowstorm has produced so far 58 passive solar banana crops. Uh, <clears throat> without needing to look like this, my house helped to inspire over 30,000 European passive buildings that likewise have no heating and roughly normal construction cost. By 2020, all new EU buildings <clears throat> must use nearly zero energy and this works anywhere from Old Snowmass to Bangkok, pretty much the full range of the Earth's climates. But wherever you live, integrative design gives many benefits from each expenditure. The white arch, for example, that holds up the middle of my house has 12 different functions, but only one cost. Now, how fast is the state of the art moving? Well, the 38% energy saving in the Empire State Building retrofit seemed pretty good until our cost-effective retrofit three years later saved 70 percent, making this half-century-old federal complex more efficient than the best new U.S. office, which in turn is only half as efficient as RMI's new office now being built four years later with no central heating and cooling equipment and a strong business case. Even in sweltering India, our partners likewise saved 80 percent of the energy at 10 or, 10 or 20 percent lower capex and the building's photovoltaics takes make the rest. Uh, <clears throat> in Holland, by the way, <clears throat> they're expecting probably this year to be able to pay for retrofitting old social housing to net zero energy paid for entirely out of the energy savings. Integrative design can also increase the half trillion dollars of conventional energy savings in industry uh, Dow Chemical has already captured over $9 billion of those savings on a billion dollar investment, but there's a lot more to do. For example, three-fifths of the world's electricity runs motors, half of that runs pumps and fans. You can improve all that stuff. Motor systems that turn them can save about half their energy with a year payback by integrating 35 improvements. But first we ought to be capturing bigger, cheaper savings normally ignored, and again, not in any official study or forecast. For example, pumps, the biggest use of motors, move liquid through pipes. A typical industrial pumping loop, though, was redesigned to use at least 86% less pumping energy, not by getting better pumps and motors and controls, ju but just by replacing long, thin, crooked pipes with fat, short, straight pipes. This is not even a technology. It's just rearranging our mental furniture as designers. In my own house, it recently saved about 97% of pumping energy and some new piping. So what do such savings mean for the electricity that's three-fifths used in motors? Well, from the coal burned at the power plant to the end use, many successive losses compound, so only a tenth of the coal energy comes out the pipe as flow. However, if we turn those compounding losses left to right around backwards, they, comp they become compounding savings and every unit of flow or friction in the pipe saves 10 units of fuel and cost and pollution and global weirding back at the power plant. And as you go back upstream, 
the components get smaller and cheaper, the total capital cost goes down. So our team has lately found such snowballing energy savings in over $40 billion worth of diverse industrial redesigns from this Hewlett-Packard data center and Texas Instruments chip fab to Rio Tinto and Anglo-American mines and Shell hydrocarbon facilities and so on. Typically, our retrofit designs save about 30 to 60 percent of the energy with two or three year paybacks, while our new facility designs save around 40 to 90 odd percent with generally lower capital cost. So as all this starts to happen and buildings and industry get efficient faster than they grow, electricity demand keeps falling in the U.S., Europe, Japan, helping renewables uh, replace fossil fueled electricity. The biggest modern renewables uh, plummeting real costs shown on this logarithmic scale for photovoltaics in blue and wind farms in green uh, are driven largely by the gigantic Chinese market. China now leads the world in renewables. It's number one in seven kinds of them and has produced for each of the past three years more wind power than nuclear power, which it has the world's most aggressive program. In 2013 alone, China added more photovoltaic capacity than the U.S. installed since inventing it 61 years ago. In 20 of the United States, firms will now happily install rooftop photovoltaics on your house with no money down, maybe soon cash back, and beat your electric bill. Uh, Deutsche Bank and UBS expect that will be profitable in about four-fifths of the world by 2017. And bypassing power companies the way cell phones bypassed wireline phone companies gives electric executives nightmares and venture capitalists sweet dreams. Batteries, too, are getting rapidly cheaper, letting more customers choose to shift their loads under their solar curves or to drop off the grid altogether. So the old utility business models have no place to hide. That's why Barclays downgraded the whole U.S. utility sector, which now pays two or three percentage points more for capital than solar installers do. The competition is not just in risk <coughs> and capex, but also in revenue model. Renewables have no operating costs. So when I flip the switch, I'm not sending any more revenue to the utility. Moreover, your new oil or gas well makes my next one cost more, but your new solar panel makes my next one cost less. Can fossil fuels really win this game? Bloomberg thinks not and projects that over the next 15 years, <coughs> the additions of fossil fuel and nuclear uh, will fall uh, by about half while the additions from renewables triple. Uh, and the market evidence is that in each of the past four years, modern renewables, not counting big hydro, uh, have added over 80 gigawatts a year, more than the net additions of fossil plus nuclear. And they got over a quarter trillion dollars of annual investment, far more than the world coal industry's entire market cap. So uh, there, there is a lot of market evidence, like the split of the big German utility, E.ON, into two, uh, that this is how smart operators view what's happening. Uh, also, the cheaper renewable power gets, the more we buy, so the cheaper it gets, so the more we buy, and so on. And modern renewables scale up in a fundamentally different way. Traditionally, we build giant cathedral-like power plants, taking years to design and license and then to build. But meanwhile, with about the same capital, each year you can build a photovoltaic factory, which each year thereafter produces enough solar cells to produce each year thereafter as much electricity as your cathedral will annually produce. So after 10 years of that, you already have 15 times as much solar electricity as your cathedral would have yielded. And that's why solar output worldwide is scaling faster than cell phones. We're often told, though, by the way, I'm at 32 minutes. I have 40. Uh, we're often told, though, that only coal and combined cycle gas and nuclear stations can keep the lights on because they are 24-7, while wind power and photovoltaics are variable and thus supposedly unreliable. So let me, let me explain why neither part of that statement is true. First, variable does not mean unpredictable. Uh, here's how the French grid operator forecast a stormy bunts wind power output for France uh, a day ahead compared with the actual output a day later. I'll bet they wish they could forecast demand that well. Uh, <clears throat> and then, of course, the reason we built the grid is that no generator is 24-7. They all break. And when a giant 
colder nuclear plant breaks, you just lost a billion watts in milliseconds, uh, often for weeks or months, often without warning. So grids are designed to and do routinely handle this intermittence by backing up failed plants with working plants. And in exactly the same way, but often at lower cost, grids can handle the forecastable variations of photovoltaic and wind power by backing up those variable renewables mainly with other renewables of other kinds or in other places. Thus, highly reliable power can come from a portfolio of largely or wholly renewable sources when they are forecasted, integrated, and diversified by type and location. Let me illustrate this with an aggressive but instructive hourly simulation from Texas, which has its own grid not connected to the rest of the United States. Uh, <clears throat> and it's a rather difficult case. In 2050, it's expected summer electric load shape looks like this, or smaller or less peaky if you use very profitable efficiency as well. Now, let's do all of this with renewables. Uh, the first 86% of the annual electricity coming from a mixture of wind and photovoltaics. You can see they really are variable. And <clears throat> the other 14% coming from dispatchable renewables you can have whenever you want. That's all the rest, like geothermal, small hydro, solar thermal electric, feedlot biogas, burned in existing gas turbines, uh, burning municipal waste, burning obsolete energy studies. Uh, this 100% renewable supply can then be matched to the load, which you can see it isn't very well initially, by <clears throat> putting the surpluses into two types of distributed storage, namely ice storage, air conditioning, and electric vehicles. And the only aggressive assumption here is I'm assuming both are fully built out by 2050, which does seem feasible. Uh, and then recovering that energy when needed and filling the last gaps with unobtrusively flexible demand. So now we're 100% renewable every hour of the year, highly reliable. Only 5% of the annual renewables output is surplus, so the economics should be good. I want to emphasize this is not just an analytic or theoretical result. Some national grid operators already run this way. Uh, Germany was 27% renewably powered last year, Italy 33. But four other European countries with modest or no hydropower got about half their electricity consumption from renewables without adding bulk storage. They sustained superior reliability, which for Denmark and Germany was about 10 times better than America's. So the operators have learned to run these grids the way a conductor leads a symphony orchestra. No instrument plays all the time, but the ensemble continuously produces beautiful music. The Right size for the job is also important in power generation. And the most advanced national example is Denmark. Over three decades, they've shifted from a handful of giant fossil plants to a constellation of wind farms in blue, 86% locally owned, and ag waste cogen plants <coughs> in brown. Uh, they're almost done with that transition and plan completely renewable electricity and energy by 2050 at essentially no extra cost. They're well on track for that, and they're reorganizing their grid in a cellular architecture that makes cascading blackouts impossible. Now, in America, we have this dirty, aging, insecure electricity system we have to replace anyway by 2050. And whatever we replace it with is going to cost the same. Uh, more of what we've got, new nuclear and so-called clean coal, centralized renewables, distributed renewables. But these differ profoundly in risks, <coughs> seven kinds around national security, fuel, water, finance, technology, climate, and health. However, it turns out that a distributed renewables future properly designed best manages all these risks and can eliminate the risk of major cascading blackouts. That is the Pentagon strategy now for military power supplies. It's the way my house works. And it has huge security benefits. So to summarize the electricity sector, together, <coughs> Efficient use and diverse distributed renewable resilient supply are turning the whole sector upside down. Instead of building a few big plants and a bit of efficiency at renewables, uh, especially when we reward utilities for selling more electricity, as we do in 34 states and most of the world, uh, we're changing the policy so far in 16 states to reward cutting your bills, and then the investments go other way up. 
especially in the 30-odd states where demand-side resources can bid into supply-side auctions. Uh, this can happen really fast. Look down Fifth Avenue in 1900, you have to look hard for the first car. Thirteen years later, you have to look hard for the last horse. In fact, I haven't found it yet. Uh, <clears throat> Tony Seba at Stanford found these in the National Archive. Uh, and the horse and buggy industry thought it would have a long time to change. But, you know, the pace of transformation is set by insurgents, not incumbents. And in fact, it's even faster than that because investors flee before customers do. Uh, capital markets keenly sniff out disruption. Once the markets think you're in the toaster or heading for the toaster, they don't wait for the toast to get done before shifting their capital. As Jack Welch said, if the rate of change on the outside is greater than the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. There's one last driver of rapid change I'll mention briefly. Uh, people making, on average, less than $2 per household per day, 1.2 billion people and off the grid uh, <coughs> live in darkness at night. And they pay $38 billion a year for kerosene. I brought along a little state-of-the-art photovoltaic, high-temp lithium battery and LED package that gives a payback of weeks to a couple of months displacing that kerosene with huge benefits for public health and you can teach your daughter to read. Uh, and uh, it's equivalent to a lifetime annuity of an extra month's income per year. So that's where the last lighting market 140 years old is going. Uh, and if you led a fuel or electricity co uh, company, which of these models uh, would you uh, <coughs> and trust with your, your firm's future. So to sum up, our energy future is not fate but choice. That choice is very flexible. In 75, our government said that energy used to make a dollar of GDP could never go down. I heretically suggested it could drop threefold over 50 years. So far, it's down 54% over the first 39 years. But now we have much better technologies, integrative design and light regulation, maturing financing, marketing and delivery channels that can save another threefold or twice what I originally thought. You see, we're doing pretty well so far. But now we can save twice that much at only a third the real cost. And that's just the innovation that's already happened, not the innovation that's going to happen. So to solve the energy problem, we just needed to enlarge it and integrate it. And the results may at first seem incredible, but as Marshall McLuhan said, only puny secrets need protection. Big discoveries are protected by public incredulity. So let me end by summarizing uh, what we just found doing the same exercise for China. <coughs> uh, and that's a collaboration of four organizations, two NGOs, two government labs, uh, <clears throat> using Chinese data models, examples, analysts. It's their program. It's not what somebody's telling them what to do. So we've had about 40 people on this the last two years reporting to the energy authors for the 13th five-year plan. And uh, our preliminary findings <laughs> to be released in three weeks show how China could have a seven-fold bigger GDP in 2050, which is their official goal, using about the same energy as today, getting about three-fifths of it from non-fossil sources, uh, <clears throat> all trillions of dollars cheaper than business as usual if externalities are valued at zero. Car CO2 emissions would fall to about two-fifths below the 2010 levels, coal use by four-fifths, conventional air pollution without any control technologies added by 90 or 95 percent. Energy productivity could rise over sixfold, carbon productivity 12-fold, and President Xi's peak carbon commitment could be achieved even sooner. In fact, as many of you know, China's coal burn already fell last year in absolute terms, even as GDP grew 7.4 percent. That leadership in stabilizing global climate perfectly fits China's need for non-polluting high-value added drivers of growth. So the U.S. reinventing fire analysis provides a low-carbon, high-prosperity roadmap for the developed world. Reinventing fire China provides such a model for the developing world. And the world can solve the climate problem at a profit, not at a cost, 
with the tools, leadership, and collaboration of these two countries. For our side, the U.S. is already on track for the reinventing fire trajectory, uh, and the Chinese side, I think, is, is well ahead of anybody's expectations, possibly including their own. I hope that will uh, stimulate some useful conversation. I thank you for your good work and your kind attention. Uh, Dr. Lovins for this uh, inspiring presentation and uh, we have five minutes for questions so you can go to the microphone introduce yourself please keep the questions brief and please and be sure to return the carbon cap and uh, you can also ask questions on uh, Twitter if you wish so are there I'm any sure, questions I'm sure I said nothing controversial <laughs> Anne-Marie, my name is Melinda Marquis, and I remember seeing, uh, going to your house in 1983 and seeing the uh, tropical plants and sh no home should ever have a, a dryer or anything. It, it was an amazing house. It looks like you've done some work on it. Come back. We've done a major renovation. It was, it was really cool. I was, I was a kid then, and uh, I remember seeing you at the University of Colorado, I think in the UMC in 1986. And I was just flabbergasted by the charts that you put up with the numbers proving that the United States would save a lot of money in coming decades if people were just given cheap cars that were very fuel efficient and the amount of money that the United States would save uh, basically from their defense budget fighting wars in the Middle East. And I think that was 29 years ago. I don't know if you remember it, but I do. Well, I, I, I remember a lot of the theme because I'm advising the chief of naval operations and teaching at the Naval Postgraduate School. You made a big, big impression on me then and I'm surprised that today you feel, you seem to exude a great deal of optimism that uh, if I'm interpreting you correctly, you seem to be very pleased with the rate of change of adopting fuel efficiency and um, I presume also therefore cutting uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I'm really worried about the, the greenhouse gas emissions and the fact that they continue to go up, not down, largely because the rest of the world is developing their economy. So can you say a bit more, I mean, are you truly pleased with the rate of change? Because that's what it sounds like you're saying. And um, from, from my perspective, it looks like we've got a, a serious problem here. Uh, we're both right. Uh, of course, we would have been much better off starting to do this a lot earlier and faster. But I think the, the current rates of change are very encouraging, which is why China's coal burn went down last year and that has since accelerated, and why carbon emissions stabilized last year. Uh, I think we will see a lot more of that. So it is urgent to do more and better the things I'm describing. The, the, the metal models that we use to think about this are quite important. Uh, I was once teaching a college class in which a young lady was despairing all the things going wrong and all the suffering in the universe and saying she couldn't uh, imagine bringing a child into such a world and, and how she had lost all hope. But it, it quickly became clear in conversation she hadn't lost hope at all. She knew exactly uh, where she'd left it. And if, if people <laughs> despair of the future, I, I think I have to ask, does feeling that way make you more effective? Um, I, if you go to rmi.org and in the search window enter Berkeley, you'll get my little Berkeley commencement speech about how I don't um, live in a world of optimism or pessimism just as I don't think the glass is half empty or half full from an engineering perspective, it's just twice as big as it needs to be. Uh, <clears throat> uh, optimism and pessimism, Dave Brower taught, are different sides of the same simplistic resent uh, or, or, or reversion to fatalism in which we treat the future as fate, not choice, and don't take responsibility for creating the world we want. So my colleagues and I live in a spirit I call 
implied hope <coughs> uh, in which our choices day to day create a world being worth being hopeful about. Uh, <coughs> Raymond Williams said, <coughs> to be truly radical is to make hope possible, not to spare convincing. Uh, St. Francis, and I hope, by the way, all of you have read the Pope's remarkable encyclical, which is about a great deal more than climate. Uh, <coughs> St. Francis allegedly said, preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. And according to the internet, one Michael C. Muhammad said or wrote, uh, everything is going to turn out all right in the end. If it's not all right now, it's not the end yet. Don't let it bother you, just relax and keep on going. So I hope in that spirit of applied hope, you will uh, continue and intensify your efforts to bring about faster what I'm describing, which also solves many of the other big problems in the world. Uh, and notice that it's highly trans-ideological, uh, that is, whether you, whether you care most about economic or environmental or security or social outcomes, uh, if you like any one or more of the multiple benefits, that's enough. You don't need to like every outcome. You don't need to agree which outcomes are most important. But if we focus on outcomes, not motives, we can turn gridlock and conflict into a common set of activities for whatever reason. And we see that working very well in much of the country. It, it cuts through all the political nonsense. OK, so thank you uh, very much again, uh, Dr. Lovins, for the uh, <laughs> very interesting presentation and uh, inspiring. And I'd like to present to you this uh, little gift for thank your you. presence. And thank you very much again. Thank you.